There is a connection between cultivating the art of living and fighting courageously for the expansion of democracy. See, the art of living is uh, learning how to die. And what I mean by that is, is that if you're really going to live life intensely, then something in you every day ought to die. Some bad habit, some prejudice, some faulty presupposition, so that you're continually involved in a struggle to better yourself, become more mature, more compassionate, more courageous. And we need that compassion and courage and maturity to expand democracy because in the end, that is still the best ideal that we fragmented, cracked vessels called human beings have been able to come up with. Earlier when we opened up with some theme music uh, from John Coltrane and this, yeah. this uh, you knew, I did not show you this in advance. You knew this was 1959. Oh, yeah. Do you have everything he's ever Oh no, recorded? Coltrane was so prolific. Yeah, it's like trying to read all of Tolstoy. You know, you spend a lifetime, but I mean, the peaks. And most importantly, it's not a question of how much, but it's how deeply you have internalized his sensibility. Do you collect music? Do you listen yeah. to music? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, listen to a variety of music. Coltrane, of course, is at the center. But it's the, I, I carry Coltrane around with me every day, the way I carry Chekhov around with me every day. And it's linked not just to the music as some ornament, some art object, but it's got to become part of your soul. You know, when Chekhov says, I wake up every morning squeezing the slave out of me so that I will have the uh, real, I have running in my veins the blood of a real human being. You see, that's, that's Coltrane and Chekhov. No, I don't talk much, you know, but you got me talking, man, for hours I've been talking, and I'm not a talker. But uh, I thought about this question after I'd answered it the best I could, and I felt that I, I didn't tell him. What I didn't tell him was what I really wanted to. But uh, he, he felt that I was Christian. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, I am by as far as birth, or my mother was, mm -hmm. or my father was, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, my early teachings were mm -hmm. the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And um, as upon uh, now, as I look out upon the world, and it's always been a thing with me, to feel that uh, all men know the truth. Uh -huh. see? I see. And uh, so therefore I've always felt that even though a man was not a Christian, uh -huh. he still had to know the truth somewhere. Uh -huh. Or if he was a Christian, he could know the truth. Uh -huh. Or he could not. It's according to whether he knew the truth, uh -huh. and the truth itself uh -huh. doesn't have any name on it. To uh -huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, each man has to find this for himself, I think. Yeah. Oh, I would, uh, I tell you, um, I believe that a man ought to, mm -hmm. or here to, to grow mm -hmm. themselves into the full, into the best good that they can be. At least this is what I want to do. And, you know, this is my belief. That we are supposed to, I'm supposed to go to the best good that I can get to. And uh, when I, as I, as I'm going there, becoming this, and uh, when I become, if I ever become, it, this will just come out of the horn. So whatever it's going, whatever that's going to be, that's what it will be. I'm not in, so much interested in trying to say what it's going to be. I don't know, mm -hmm. but I just hope that I realize that mm -hmm. good can only bring good. Self-cultivating. Right. And did you get to do some uh, teaching or uh, instrumental technique from Miles? Well, there, there, there are things I learned from Miles. I, there, it's hard to put them into words, but mm -hmm. there are things of the, the musician needs to know. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you can hear it, mm -hmm. although it's hard for me to put it into words. But mm -hmm. on hearing it, I, and I sometimes I can try to bring it out in myself. Mm -hmm. so I learned mm -hmm. quite a bit there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I have it, and uh, you would like to know the answer to this. Mm. Well, I I don't feel there's an answer to this. I think that uh, it's just uh, it, it is it is either thing that they the person who doesn't understand will understand in time, mm -hmm. or upon repeated listening, or it's a thing that he never will understand. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's the way it is. There are many things in life we don't understand. <laughs> right. And we go on anyway. It's such a long time ago that I saw you for the first time in the concert hall, Concertgebouw in Amsterdam, I think. And still, every time when I go and I watch your orchestra playing and you leading the orchestra, there's always so much happiness in the whole thing, you know. I think oh. jazz means a lot of happiness. Oh, don't you think so? Yes, I do, really. Mm. I think if everybody can be happy, I mean, things should turn out better. 
for everything and well if you need, even not playing well if you're happy i mean it's, that helps yeah it helps yeah. a lot you know oh. because some of the musicians musicians sometimes look very serious and very i must say not too happy with the work they do and then i say well as long as there's music and you can just swing your music play it and be happy with it yeah, right <laughs> hmm? that's it that's the way i feel about the whole thing yeah. if i couldn't be happy i don't think i, I would uh, be along out here on the road because mm. that's my life and as you can't be happy with your life what what else yeah and I think there's another expression that they usually meet it in sport, never change a winning team. And I think same goes for music, same goes for your band. Of course, there are some changes in the musicians, you know, in the, all the years, but the okay. music never changed, you know. It's such a, a nice trademark. I think well, it's a very big compliment, if I may tell it, that after just one or two bars, you can hear, this is the day the orchestra playing. Well, I hope so. That's where we try to keep it, really. Yeah, it's yeah. perfect. It's wonderful to do that. Thank you. And you still want to go on with it i think well, of course what else yes because i hate the expression of growing old and you know and the music and things and now we have there is a time for us to go you never have to you just keep on playing well, because I'm, I'm it sounds trying. so refreshing it right. always comes a time where you see as you go as you get old i think no one knows any better than i do but uh, uh really it's uh, that doesn't stop me from wanting to still go along as long as i can get around and, and, and halfway healthy um. you know that's it. What else could you do? No, no, I think you're perfectly well, right. awfully nice to True. have this chat with you. I wish you all the luck, a lot of happiness, and a very good birthday on your 21st of August, I'm, if I'm well informed. I rem I'll remember that. Thank and I don't mention the age, <laughs> because this, it doesn't well, count. <laughs> oh, well, I don't see why. Everybody knows it. Yeah, yeah but, I'm you uh, know, if I just see you sitting there playing with the rhythm section, well, you know, you you, just you're all about the same age. Just you with the, he looks like he's about 75 young. Yeah, young. Yeah, <laughs> Do you sometimes have the feeling that, I mean, obviously people are asking the same questions all the time, that it's the music do. is your statement and do. not, not the talking? No, no, I think it's, it's more than music, you know, you, we're personalities, so you talk about more than music. I mean, if, if all you talked about was music, depending on if you're a music paper, then you talk about music. But there's more to us than just writing songs. I mean, we do other things and we have characters and it uh, depends what you talk about. So um, I don't mind it, no. And, and of course people ask the same questions, because some, some of the questions are current and they want to know about uh, the same things. So ask me about my solo album then, huh? <laughs> yeah, what about your solo album? Oh, it's great. Of course it is. <laughs> what about the, the actual work in the studio when you four come together and everybody wants to, to bring his side of songs? Yeah, that albums. happens all the time, yeah. It well, sounds like having also It's uh, like a arguments. cockfight, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, four well, we, we've all, uh, four cocks fighting. God, it's getting nice, this. <laughs> no, but you know, the funny thing is, this this sort of happened almost when we met, the four of us, and it's it's just, you won't believe it. I mean, people think that, okay, now they're fighting. We fought on virtually the first day, because we used to know each other from university and all that, and we used to fight about um, um, musical um, um, ideas and this and that, because we're all very strong characters, you know, and we all have egos and all that, so we always kept fighting. But I think the, the fighting seems to keep us together. Because um, I think sometimes, uh, I think bands break up when there's one very strong person and the others, and, and the others get left out and they think, oh God, this asshole is just too strong and we want to join another band. But the four of us are real, actually I can't say these four letter words, huh? so we're very strong you know, individually, so we just keep uh, going at each other. And I think the reason we've stayed together for so long is just none of us want to leave because, I mean, if you leave, it's like being a coward and you're going out. So we still keep going and... Um, as long as the music is still there, and as long as the people are still buying the music, then then it's okay. When they stop buying our records, then I'll say goodbye and do something else, become a strip artist or something. Yeah? What, to what music you would strip? What music would you use? All the songs I've written! <laughs> like, come on! <laughs> what does it mean to you? I mean, I talked to Keith Richards recently, and he said the most important thing in his career was when he realized that being on stage and being admired by young kids is not the answer to life. Did you have a similar experience once when you first of all thought that's it and then you're um, at, uh, from a certain stage you're thinking of something else that's... No, the most important thing to me is to be happy, to be honest, to have fun. And depending on how, whatever I do, I mean, of course music is important to me and because uh, that's my life. And uh, as long as, I mean, I can, uh, I'll carry on as long as I, uh, I write music and people want to buy it. That's important to me, but I mean that's not the be all and the end all. I mean I just uh, they're very sort of, to me happiness ha happiness is 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 the most important thing, and if I'm happy then it shows in my work and and so basically I just want to be happy and um, make a lot of money and, and and buy a lot of things, especially in Vienna. <laughs> yeah. What do you like to hear if somebody comes up after a concert? What kind of compliment do you like? 
I don't know. I don't really live on compliments. Matter of fact, it has a way of distracting me. I know a whole lot of other musicians and artists that are out there today, you know. They hear all these compliments, they say, wow, it must have been really great. So they get fat and satisfied and they get lost and they forget about the actual talent that they have and they start living into another world, you know. That's an interesting problem, isn't it? You, uh, if someone said about Janis Joplin, who's a su superstar now, you, you know Janis, I expect. Superstar, oh yeah. Well, so they, they did, yes, she I, certainly is in my heart. Uh, I'm super chicken. <laughs> don't you forget it. <laughs> and, don't, and don't I forget it? No, I was gonna say, uh, the problem of succeeding is a hard one for you if your basis, say, is in the blues or something like that, and you suddenly make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Uh, someone said it's hard to, to sing the blues when you're making that kind of money. Uh, yeah. This assumes that you can't be unhappy and have a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes it gets to be really easy to sing the blues when you're supposed to be making all this much money, you know. Because, like, money is it's getting to be out of hand now, you know. It's, you know, and like musicians, especially young cats, you know, they get a chance to make all this money and they say, wow, this is fantastic. And like I said before, they lose themselves and they forget about the music itself, you know. They forget about their talents. They forget about the other half of them. So therefore, you can sing a whole lot of blues. The more money you make, the more blues sometimes you can sing. But the idea is like a, to, you know, use all these hang-ups and all these different things, you know, let, as steps in life, you know. It's like drinking coffee where well, you don't drink it every day or else you go into another scene with it, you know. Like it escapes and all this. I don't know, but it sounds good. No. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to the commercial success and the career and all that, I hear you're on a spiritual path now that's opening up for you. Yes. What led to that? I think um, when a person is presented with challenges, um, I'm not wearing mascara, so if a couple of teardrops fall, it's not going to matter. Um, I think for myself that it's it's forced me on some levels to seek the spiritual out. And I'm glad that I have. It's, you know, on, on some levels, my faith has been tested in a way that I, you know, I, I, never, I never even dreamed possible. But at the same time, out of all of the challenges and stuff, there's growth. Yeah. And that's, that's what's happening for me. Um, you know, um, my wonderful husband that I've been married to for almost 15 years has Parkinson's disease, and um, and it's really a challenge. And but you know, we love each other enough that no matter what, we stand tall and 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 together, whatever needs to be faced. And that's that's the true grit of being married and being with somebody that you love a lot. What are you finding, though, on this path that's helping you through this? What are the truths that you're discovering? That love is all-inclusive. Yeah. Yeah, that love is all-inclusive and will carry, carry me through. Um, and I thank God that, you know, first and foremost, above all, you know, I thank God for my sobriety because it's really helping me uh, especially through times that can be a little bit challenging. But, but there's always, you know, there's always the sunbeam um, and the rainbow within that sunbeam. And I, I, I thank God. I, I wouldn't trade, you know what I mean? I wouldn't tr trade for anything. I, I would live my life, every step of the way, I would live my life exactly the way that I'm living it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because... Stevie Wonder said it so beautifully, uh, you brought the joy inside my tears. And um, yeah, that's, that kind of like says it all. I've never seen anything quite like it today. There was a pilgrimage to the studio. Uh, Paul Schaefer, I don't know, you name the person. I saw people come up to say hello to the master. Does that happen wherever you go? Yeah, sometimes they embarrass you. They embarrass you? Yeah. You don't like being an idol. I don't want and the, well, you know, the drummers drop sticks when I walk out. Do they mean, I mean to? If somebody tells them Miles to be down here tonight, right there. Yeah. I'd be I'd be nervous. If I were playing my clarinet somewhere and I knew you were coming in, <laughs> that would be more than you more be than. Be nervous if you know what you're going to do. You know, yeah. if you know you can play. What would it take, seriously, for a musician to be good enough to play in the Miles Davis band? Suppose you need a new a new guy. The first thing he has to do is whoever it is. Has to have good carriage. You know? Meaning? And meaning that they have to 
look like what they're going to play. They have to. Not look like they just bought it. No, I mean, not like this. But. Good carriage. <laughs> how, how, how am I going to know if he's putting me on? <laughs> no. no. Tennis players have a certain way they stand. Yeah. Bob stands like this. Take charge, guy, like Rambo. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of macho in that stance. Drop it, you have to. Yeah. Strong. You can tell by the way the guy holds it before he even puts it to his mouth, whether he's a musician, a real musician. Whether you can play. Yeah. I also feel like it's not glorification. No matter what these people say about me, my music does not glorify any image. My music is spiritual if you listen to it. It's all about emotion. It's all about um, life. And it's, I, with other rappers, not to diss nobody, but where other rappers might, you know, paint a perfect picture of themselves or, you know, whatever, I get, I tell my, my, my innermost darkest secrets. I reveal myself in every one of my records, from Dear Mama, to shed so many tears. I tell my own personal problems, you know, and people can relate to that, I believe. And that's what makes it sell the few copies we do sell. Do you have any comments on setting the record straight, friends or foes? Yeah, I'm going to say it like the Spanish dude in here always tell me. I don't got no friends. I don't got no friends. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I got supporters, people on my side, and people on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, I ain't going to blow up nobody's name. Mm -hmm. But I will say that. Uh, as far as that vibe interview, and everybody was saying, you know, everybody that was involved knows what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and everything is there. If people, if you got a brain, just read everything over. And read my reply, read their reply, read what people say. Watch people. Because you can fake for a long time, but one day, you're going to show yourself to be a phony. That's for sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what these, you know, a lot of people are doing these days. Um, think back. Did you think about all the people that, that you've seen me put on stage? Think about all the people that I put on, that I got into this game, that I show how to do this. Mm -hmm. And think about what they're saying now. That's not keeping it real. Mm -hmm. um, as far as foes and enemies and all that, I really don't care. My only fear of death is coming back reincarnated. You know, I don't have no, I don't have no uh, negative feelings towards nobody. It's not like I'm going to get out and go shoot somebody up. You know what I mean? I know mm -hmm. who shot me. I didn't, you know, I don't care about telling the police none of that. I don't care about none of that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Whatever. I'm still here. You know what I mean? Um, and I, 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 it's not like I'm untouchable. I can, I can be killed as soon as I get out of here. You know what I mean? But I go cool. I'm cool. You know what I mean? I go, you know, screaming west side and, and I'm all good. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But what I want people to know is that don't, don't support the phonies. Support the real. You know what I mean? How can these people be talking about how they so real and they don't care about our communities? How can they be talking about what they all this, you know, the hood, blah, 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 blah. They don't care about our communities. You know what I mean? Listen to the words that people say in their lyrics and tell me if that's some real, sh if that's real to you. You know what I mean? Listen to what they saying. Don't just bob your head to the beat. Peep the game and listen to what I'm saying. Hold us accountable for it. You know what I mean? Um, and really, you know, whatever. If somebody else blow up and I fade out, that's just how it's supposed to be. That's fake. And I don't got no problems with that. Um, I don't got no problems with nobody in the whole industry. I wish everybody success. It's enough loot for us all to make money. Um, but I will say, I already took five bullets. And if I can help it, I don't plan on taking no more. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, I would tell each and every person out there, don't forget about that clicking up thing, you know what I mean? Be to yourself. Stay to yourself. Trust nobody. Trust nobody. After dog. You know what I mean? Straight mm -hmm. up. My closest friends did me in. My mm -hmm. closest friends, my homies, people who I done took care of their whole family. I done took care of everything for them, looked out for them, put them in the game, everything. Turned on me. Fear is stronger than love. Remember that. Mm -hmm. Fear is stronger than love. All the love I gave didn't mean nothing when it came to fear. So it's all good. But I'm a soldier. I always survive. I constantly come back. You know what I mean? Only thing that can kill me is death. That's the only thing that'll ever stop me is death. And even then, my music will live forever. Thug Life, I've been getting the blame for all, everything that Thug Life ever did. Everything, anybody can say Thug Life, and then it, it always comes back to me. I didn't have policemen get killed, and I get blamed for it, and, you know, all type of violence, and I get blamed for it. And I want to say that, you know, I didn't create Thug Life. I diagnosed it. You know, mm -hmm. just like if a doctor says, this is the AIDS virus. Mm -hmm. He didn't make AIDS. 
he diagnosed it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I he won't be held responsible for every AIDS case. Mm -hmm. You know, if anything, he's bringing you information on maybe finding a cure. I felt as though that's the same thing I did for Thug Life. And in Vibe Magazine, when I said Thug Life is dead, that does not mean that Thug Life is dead in the world. That just means that I have graduated to the next level to be a player. Mm -hmm. Not a player of females, but a player of life. This mm -hmm. game of life is a game, mm -hmm. and you have to play it to the fullest. Mm -hmm. And um, I graduated, you know, I'm in college now, the college of life, you know? Mm -hmm. And I want my brothers to graduate too. I could easily just look down on you and go, the mom's stupid, you know what I mean? I know something now they don't know, but that mm -hmm. ain't me, that ain't never been me. When Thug Life was not out there and I was pumping it to you, I wanted you to know what it was like. And now I want you to know what the next level was like. So I had people telling me, you softened up, ain't nothing soft about me, ain't nothing changed. Um, if anything, I feel like the other dudes is soft because they out there fronting. Mm -hmm. They watching they watching little kids get killed and they still talking it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's cool to talk about it, to recognize it, but I mean, how many times can we say the same thing? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I know it's a way for us to get out the hood, but what are we running to? You know what I mean? Once we get out the hood, shit, they don't want us over there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, and also for the people out there, we need to start supporting not every black person that go to jail or go, get into trouble, but the ones that you know didn't do it. Exactly. You know what I mean? I feel yeah. like people know mm -hmm. I didn't do this. They saying right now, they still say Tupac score, rape charge. I'm, I'm not convicted of no rape charge. I want to make that real clear. Mm -hmm. my, my charge was um, sexual abuse, forcibly touching the buttocks. That's what they charge. But I'm innocent of that, but that's what I'm in jail for. You understand? Mm -hmm. Um, and we just got to be smarter and sharper or they're going to start taking away each and every person that steps forward to do anything positive for the community. So that's why you be wondering why everybody want to live a negative lifestyle. It's safer. And the community don't support us when we do step out and take bullets for y'all. Mm -hmm. And now let's talk about how to turn life into meaning as we set you forth. Because look, it's actually freakishly tricky to turn life, uh, turn a long life or life at all into a meaningful life. People think it's easy, but then once you get a certain age, you start going to funerals and not all the, fu there's not an equality among funerals. Some funerals are better than others because some lives were more meaningful than others. And this is what people don't tell you, uh, but it's nevertheless the case. So I'm going to give you kind of the building blocks of a meaningful life. And, and, and I hope you can do with what you will with that. And it's not always the longest life, right? Even, you know, a lot of people might watch this are Christians. Jesus only made it to about 33. So it's not as if the people who made it to 93 did live their life more meaningfully than he did. So we need to kind of think through what it means to live a meaningful life and what, would, what are going to be the constitutive conditions of it. Because it's not just long. It's not just having money because a lot of people have money and have a hard time turning money into meaning. You just look at their medicine cabinets and you, you find out that they, they, there's a lot going on and it's a struggle. And that's the struggle that you're going to be kind of thrown off into uh, as a modern person whose biggest problem is how to turn my freedom into meaning. How to turn my freedom into meaning. And it's possible that your K-12 through education did not prepare you to do that, but I'm going to do that in the next 15 minutes. So you're welcome, but understand that that's the problem. And it's an indeterminate problem. When I say modern, I mean the modern problem is how do I make sense of freedom in a world where science seems to work? So how do I make sense of my freedom? How do I turn my freedom into meaning? And so it's going to be a problem of indeterminacy. Determinacy means I have like a concrete problem. I know what it is. Indeterminacy is me. I don't, I don't really know what to do. I could do anything. I could be anything. But that means I could also be nothing. Because if you can be anything, that means you are nothing in a way. It's like... When you want to eat, do you want a spoon that's a good spoon? Or do you want a fork that's a good fork? Or do you want a spork? You don't want to really live the life of a spork because sporks are neither good at being spoons nor good at being forks. You want to actually be a thing. But what thing should you be? That is up to you. And it's not always obvious what to do. So what to, how to turn your freedom into meaning. Some people have to deal with this with what college to go to. Other people are going to have to deal with it with what major. What job I should get? Should I go into the armed forces? Like all of these decisions are about how to turn my freedom into a meaningful life. And it's almost easier if it's determined for you, if you just follow the script. In a way, it's easier. Not in the best way, but there is a way in which like if I'm under shackles, I know what my problem is. I need to get these shackles off. If I'm behind bars, if I'm in jail, I know what the problem is. I need to get out of jail. Now you've just kind of been cast off 
in a way that you don't actually know what the problem is, yet you know that if you don't make real decisions, if you're not appropriately decisive, you could waste your life. Right? And that's a real problem. So if you feel anxiety about that, once again, I want to say that it is an appropriate anxiety. What, how to turn your freedom into meaning is the appropriate concern to have. And make no mistake, a lot of people screw it up. And uh, <laughs> I've... I, you know, you go to some funerals and they run out of stories to tell about a person because they didn't do anything particularly meaningful after a certain point in their life or they kind of didn't think through it. So, or you go to a different funeral and they have, you know, a really action-packed shiver for, for, for seven days. So it's, you have to understand that turning life into meaning is a job. It is actually, it's your job as a human, but it's, it needs other people and it's not obvious. So I'm going to tell you that. Like I said, I'm not going to tell you that in school, but I'm going to tell you that now. And it's always, and it's not necessarily the longest life, but you need to live in order to live a meaningful life. So eat your vegetables and don't smoke. Smoking's a dirty habit. Uh, and in general, don't start any habits that you're going to have to quit. I want to say that again. Just as a rule of thumb, don't start any habits that you're going to have to quit because when it's time for you to quit them, they're going to be, those habits are going to be in the way of your new meaningful project. And so if you don't want anything in the way of your new meaningful project, don't start any habits that you're going to have to eventually quit because when the meaningful project comes, you're just going to want to throw yourself into it without any like baggage of a habit that you're going to have to pick up. Right. And right next next to the politics of sentimentality that gets gets problems, that gives you problems, is going to be a politics of the left calls it materialism. It's the idea that matter is what really matters, not ideas. Matter is what really matters. And and that's and that's good. Materialism is good. Materialist politics is good insofar as like it could actually theorize conflict. It could ex it can get you to understand like, no, your boss is looking to exploit you for cheap. You're not going to really like um, talk them into being just to you. You need to fight them. So that's about power. So we get some aspects of labor relations correct. But uh, thoroughgoing materialism, once again, if everything is about matter and not ideas, ideas are universal, but your matter is just kind of what you kind of are made up of. It's about you. It individualizes what are really political struggles and ideological struggles. Uh, materialism is important because it came uh, because for most of human history, the people who thought of politics well actually understood that matter is less important or it's not even real. Matter might not even be real. Ideas are real. Forms are real. Like matter itself is nothing until it becomes something because like we imbue it. A chair is not a chair because of what it's made of. A chair is a chair because it allows me to sit. Right? So it's not like the stuff that makes it what it is. It's, the, it's in the right form, and that form can hold my tuchus in it. Religion is deeply ingrained in you. Deeply ingrained. All religions? You All religions. I don't, lot believe, of religion. I don't Interest believe in religion. I don't believe in any one uh, religion. No, I don't believe in any one religion. I believe in Allah. I believe in the Hindu religion because I studied yoga for 21 years. I believe in Buddhism. I believe in all of them because they're necessary for the sheep, darling. The sheep have to have something to follow, and religion is necessary. I believe in all of them. Do you consider yourself a great guitarist? Well, I'm specialized. What I do on the guitar has uh, very little to do with what other people do on a guitar. Most of the other guitar solos that you hear performed on stage have been practiced over and over and over again. They go out there and they play the same one every night, and it's really just spotless. My theory is this, I have a basic mechanical knowledge of the operation of the instrument and I got an imagination. And when the time comes up in the song to play a solo, it's me against the laws of nature. I don't know what I'm going to play, I don't know what I'm going to do. I know roughly how long I have to do it and it's a game where you have a piece of time and you get to decorate it. And depending on how intuitive the rhythm section is, it's backing you up. You can do things that are literally impossible to imagine sitting here. but. You can see them performed uh, before your very eyes in a, in a live performance situation. I don't like any of the guitar solos that have ever been released on a record. And I think that uh, the real fun of playing the guitar is doing it live, not freezing it and saving it on a piece of plastic someplace or putting it on a video. So every night then is spontaneous for you, huh? Absolutely. 
It keeps it fun? Well, think of it the other way. You know, what if you had to play exactly the same notes every night? Isn't that like punching a clock? Mm -hmm. Well, who needs that crap? Again, I mean, I, you know, I'll make a statement that I made to one of your earlier statements. It's so refreshing to hear somebody talk like that. Well, most people won't take that chance because I'll take the chance to go out there and make a mistake. I will take that chance for the privilege of doing something unique one time only live in front of an audience because that's, that's one of the reasons why the audience has come to see the concerts over and over again for the last 20 years because they know that the concert, even though you may be playing songs off the record, is a unique situation. It's only going to happen that one time. There are going to be uh, jokes happening on stage that relate to that particular audience, and there are going to be solos played during that show that will never happen again, have never happened before, will never happen again. So it's something special just for the people who bought the tickets to that show. And it's probably one of the reasons why the bootlegs of uh, these concerts have done so well over the last couple of decades. There's, just, there's hundreds of the things out, and that must be one of the reasons why people buy them, although you shouldn't buy them. No, let me explain something to you. You know what my idea of a good time is, ladies and gentlemen of the German nation, or whoever else is watching this stupid broadcast. My idea of a good time is, the biggest problem facing the world today is mental health. If everybody had good mental health, then all the other problems would be solved. Because in order to take care of mechanical and um, uh, practical problems, you have to have good mental health in order to attack those problems. If people have motives that are not worthwhile, then those bad motives are always going to creep into their activities. That, and you see that every day from the way the political people work. If people were just in a position to have their minds functioning right, then everything else would fall into line. Now, that's what I'm after. That's my dream. Now, that's a dream. That's probably not going to happen, but that's my dream. Uh, <clears throat> these kinds of recordings, and I guess the recording It's Time and Percussion Bittersweet could be included with this, um, sort of led to uh, a lot of controversy in your career and a lot of debates and discussions about racism in jazz and music for music's sake and music as propaganda and, and those kinds of things. What kind of impact do you think this, this had on your career and, and that discussion had on the, uh, that, that whole debate had? Well, you know, jazz was never the kind of a popular art form where I'm mean, popular I mean that you sold thousands of records or play to hundreds of thousands of people on your concert so it didn't affect me in, 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 in that way uh, actually but um, in fact it had it, it was just the opposite I became um, um, a person who who had who had ideals about uh, 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 things about the world, that the, the political and, and sociological situations that go on in the world, especially in the United States of America. Uh, for me, it was favorable. I was happy that, that uh, I could, for whatever music is worth in a situation like that, I could speak against, speak out against some of the injustices through my music during that particular period. Uh, I was criticized because uh, people said, well, uh, uh, art should not be used for uh, propaganda purposes, or art is for the sake of art only, and it stands alone and by itself. And there were all kinds of arguments, and of course these things, I don't, I, I don't believe that's true anyway. For me, um, disco is, 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 uh, is, uh, is a diversionary tactic to, I mean, just total disco. Say, if we just danced and danced and had fun and partied all the time, we'd never have an opportunity to look at what's really going on around us. We could be led into war, they could drop an atom bomb, we could be jobless, but as long as we, as, as long as our culture can take us into that never, never land that, and dream world solely, not that we shouldn't do that occasionally, but we should have something else to balance that off. Some reality should sneak in once in a while, not just a steady diet of, of uh, disco and, and Jaws and um, extraterrestrial films and all these kind of things. We, we, we get into a world where we can't even, we don't even know what reality is uh, uh, anymore. You know, culture can be used just to, to choreograph our minds and take us from, from one place to another place and we, um, we can live in a fantasy world, and most of us do. How many, how many people can really identify honestly with a film like Dallas? 
But most people live vicariously that life. It's a popular show because the majority of the people watch it. But so we're kind of living um, their lives vicariously and then going out into the streets where we have to struggle with all kinds of things as people. I'm talking about all the people of the country. And so, um, you know, these are the things that you question. So I didn't mind the criticism I got because I know that Dallas is also propaganda. If it can take me away from the reality and I can go to bed dreaming about the scenes that go on there and the luxury and all the riches that these people are enjoying, and I take that with me, get up in the next morning, I go to my little position in society and sit down, and I'm still there. I'm still living that life that I'd left last night on that too. And so I'm not thinking about the fact that there is racism, st racism still exists, that there's police brutality, that there's joblessness, you know, just uh, things that are plaguing us today and have been plaguing us. So um, <clears throat> this was an attempt at just using music to give us another aspect of what the power of art is. I think that uh, the things that uh, Picasso did against that were anti-war things were powerful things, and they evoked uh, thought. You could think, when I went to his exhibition, I saw some of the things he did. It was, it was meaningful to me. I think art, all art, ev everything is political. After 10 HBO hours, after a multitude of, of best-selling albums, after Grammy nominations, mm -hmm. after Emmy nominations, after Cable Ace Awards, does it all boil down to what you had said originally, that it's about, hey, dig me? And that's hey, look at me, ain't I cute? That's it's all it's just a job it's called showing off. And if you can get them to not only stop and listen, but say, isn't he cute? He's real, you're cute. If you can get the approval. See, I, in our school, we didn't have grades, so we didn't have A's, B's, and C's, and D's. The only A's I got, and this is a little corny, I got their attention, I got their approval, their admiration, their approbation, and their applause. And those were the only A's I wanted, and I got them. You I certainly have them. mine, sir. When philosophers talk about pragmatism, you're going to have to help me through some of this. Uh -huh. They are talking about Charles Pierce, William James, and John Dewey. For me, it is principally Dewey. Three theses are basic. One, anti-realism in onto ontology. Yes. So that the correspondence theory of truth is called into question, and one can no longer appeal to reality as a court of appeal to adjudicate between conflicting theories of the world. Yes. Two, anti-fundamentalism in epistemology, so that one cannot, in fact, invoke non-inferential, intrinsically credible elements in experience to justify claims about experience. And three, detranscendentalizing of the subject, the elimination of mind itself as a sphere of inquiry. Absolutely. Three very crucial moves. But keep what it, are you saying? I mean, talk to a C student here. Right. No, see, what, what we're saying is this. We can, we can start with C.I. Lewis, the great C.I. Lewis. He says that pragmatism is the doctrine that all problems are at bottom, problems of conduct, that all judgments are implicitly judgments of value. And just as there's no valid distinction between the theoretical and the practical, there is no separation between a quest for truth and a justifiable ends of action. What does that mean? That means that social practice sits at the center of how we understand our quest for truth, our quest for knowledge, our quest for the good, our quest for the beautiful, and the attempt to look for something other than contingent, shifting, change of social practices to look for something other than social practices that allows us to adjudicate between conflicting views of the world, right, is called into question. What does that mean? That means that, okay, when, when scientists tell us that this table actually consists of electrons and neutrons, right, they could be right, they could be wrong. We believe them at the moment. In that sense, they're a secular priesthood, very much like the medieval period, where they believed the priest, whatever the priest told them. We believe physicists. They could be wrong. 150 years from now, it'd be very different. Well, we never, nobody was, ever, ever, was able to see neutrons or protons, uh, neutrons or, or protons or theoretical posits, but they're the best thing we have at the moment. So we appeal to the practices of this scientific community in light of reliable methods that are connecting various trails of evidence that allow them to make valid inferences and thereby draw reliable conclusions. We say fine. But we're still appealing to the social practices of that community. Now, that doesn't mean tables don't exist. They do exist. There's no doubt about that. They do exist independent of my mind. But we can't ask the table what it is. The table doesn't speak. Nature does not speak. Black holes in the cosmos don't speak. We construct them in 
the only way we know how, language, what is language? A social practice, you see. So pragmatism here is simply saying we are temporal beings, we're historical beings, we are communal beings. And in our cooperative work together, we try to understand the world. We don't construct the world in the sense of just projecting it in an idealistic way. But we do interpret the world and understand the world, and in the end, that's all we have to go on. You see. Who was the first philosopher you got interested in? First philosopher? Well, see, I had always read Kierkegaard and Pascal and Montaigne on my own. On your own? On my own. In high school? In high school, actually, uh, in Bookmobile, actually, in the black community in Glen Elder, where I, I grew up for most of my uh, uh, childhood, which was a marvelous place to grow up. Uh, but I was reading on my own, and so I was just trying to make sense of, you know, this psychic tear of being black in America, trying to make sense of this profound sadness and sorrow that's set at the center, not just of black life, but of human life, and how you somehow transfigure it into some joy, how you transfigure it into some sense of uh, a, a pleasure. And so Pascal and Kierkegaard and Montaigne spoke to that, uh, to that, that, that sense that I felt, uh, even as a Christian, I always felt that the cross was uh, much more weightier than some of my fellow Christians put it. You know, most American Christians are post-resurrection Christians. They want the re resurrection. They want a uh, crown without a cross, whereas I was much more cross in it. How do you keep the love flowing on that cross in the form of the blood? engagement with the dark side, the underside of human history and the human predicament and so forth. And that's what I saw in Pascal. You know, he says, Christ is on the cross till the end of time. When I read that line in Pascal, I said, my God, you know, he understands something about the human condition and he certainly understands something about black people in the United States. I mean, here you have a land of dreams and possibility and yet slavery lynching Jim Crow, segregation, discrimination. What's going on? We do love the ideals of freedom, yes, but we're unfree. We love the ideals of democracy, but we're voiceless. You know, James Weldon Johnson, the Negro National Anthem, Anthem says, lift every voice. What a democratic ideal. But we're voiceless for the most part. So when I read Pascal, although he's, you know, 17th century uh, French Jansenist uh, thinker, which is a Catholic, particular kind of Catholic thinker influenced by uh, uh, Calvinistic th uh, uh, sensibilities. I said, he speaks to me. Let, let me jump through, because you've yeah, got lots yeah, of philosophy yeah, sure, and lots of your sure, past. Let sure. me just jump to a question that I want you to look a hundred years down the road, based on, mm -hmm. you call this century, I'll go back and our ghastly century. Oh, yes. Unprecedented levels of barbarity and Brutality, and I would say bestiality, but that's being unfair to the beast, really. You're talking about 200 million fellow human beings. Okay, just for, just for a second. This past century. Jump 100 years from now. The year is 3,000. Yeah. Based on what you know, what you've lived, throw it all in and tell us where you think the black human being will be in the world in the year 3,000. Boy, that's so difficult, though, uh, brother, because it depends on what we do. So we much meaning? depends on what we do. But you and I, Americans, how we relate to Africans, Asians, Latin Americans, indigenous peoples, and so forth. I think that we could have a democratic future, and I bank my, uh, my life on uh, fighting for the empowerment of um, the demos, of, of, of fellow citizens here and around the world, that their voices are heard at the highest levels of decision-making processes and institutions that guide and regulate their lives. But if the democratic tradition fails, or if it's weakened, made more feeble, we're in deep trouble because we see authoritarian regimes mediated through the new technologies. Because, see, I don't fetishize uh, technology at all. You see, the internet, new forms of communication, these are wonderful breakthroughs, yes, but they're human creations. And all human creations can be used for good or ill. We've got the same hatreds and the same loves, the same insecurities and anxieties, the same possibilities for positive breakthroughs. That's true for the radio, TV, internet, across the board. And it's still under the aegis of capital, which is to say its aim still is profit making. And therefore, we have to have some democratic accountability through the nation state or some way in which everyday people's voice can be heard vis-a-vis -vis the voices of the few, you see. So that I think there's real possibility for the 100, uh, the 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now. But on the other hand, we could have major setbacks.
I mean, it could be the case, for example, that, uh, like, for example, 1940, you only had one or two democracies, right? Because fascism had taken over much of the world. And it could be that we have a brief moment of democratic flowering, and then it dries up. And that means that this particular book and my voice would be just a voice in the wilderness.